Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to have you join us again. Uh, my name is Dr. G. Christine Taylor, and I serve as the Vice President and Associate Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and have the honor of leading the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here on the campus. Um, I, we're excited about today's program. This continues in our series, uh, one that we began last fall, called Come Sit at My Table, and it's a series of conversations that focus on issues related to difference and diversity. I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping notes up front. Um, many people have contacted us about the virtual vigil. It is now currently posted on our website, and we invite you to visit there to see it if you weren't able to uh, be a part or of the the virtual vigil that we had last Thursday, and our website is diversity.ua.edu. Also a heads up about another event that's happening later this week, and that is on June 11th, that's Thursday of this week, marks the actual anniversary of the day that Vivian Malone and John Hood uh, became students here at the University of, of Alabama. And we've got a panel to have reflections on the stand in the schoolhouse door by not only uh, Dr. Cully Clark, who's written a book about it, but also uh, joining us in that conversation will be Dr. Art Dunning, who was in the second class of African-Americans to attend uh, the University of Alabama. So it's gonna be an exciting conversation. It will also begin on this Thursday at one o'clock. All that aside, if you've got questions, um, we'll take those at the end of the presentation. We ask you to put them in the chat room. We'll also be replacing in the chat room a list of all this, the resources that our presenter today has provided. And we do encourage you to contact our office if there's additional information that you have need of. Our office email address is diversity at ua.edu. Now, having said all that, it is my absolute delight uh, to welcome our presenter today, Dr. Mary Adams Trujillo, who is going to be doing a presentation on how to be a good ally. Uh, and this is just an incredible amount of work. I, I must uh, say she's been here with us here at the University of Alabama before as a presenter when she presented as a part of the Student Government Association Diversity Certificate. And we're pleased to welcome her back again. Uh, not only is she an outstanding scholar, an outstanding activist, but she's a very, very close friend. And so without any delay, I'd like to pass this conversation over to my great friend, Dr. Mary Adams Trujillo. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. You know, um, my family members are from Alabama, so being here always feels like coming home. Um, and I thank all of you for being here today and for bringing your whole selves, for caring about injustice and righting historic wrongs. Thank you so much. Much of my work centers around um, the practice of Kingian nonviolence. So spoiler alert, this is my perspective, this is my viewpoint. But nonviolence does not mean passivity. And as Dr. King pointed out, nonviolence is for courageous people. Being an ally is one of the ways that you can participate in this global move toward correcting the imbalances of racism and police brutality. So at its core, nonviolence is embodied practice for putting your bodies as well as your minds, your thoughts into action. So today we're going to reflect on the deep wound that injustice and racial disparities in particular have left throughout this country and in our black communities especially. So the need for unified action has become abundantly clear. Today we ask ourselves, how can diverse individuals and communities become effective allies? That's how I'll begin my presentation, asking that question. Being a good ally. Next. So, Alabama, as I mentioned, let's join people in six continents who are protesting, who are out in the streets, who are building signs. Let's listen and let's link yourselves to this movement for justice. 
the murder of George Floyd has become a rallying point for so many people. Next. So in this session today, we're going to discuss what does it mean to be an ally, why be an ally, who can be an ally, and how can I become an effective ally. Next. In this moment in time and in this session, our context is the racial oppression and violence directed specifically about uh, toward black people. However, it's important to recognize that we all have power and we have privilege in different spheres of our lives. So today we're gonna to discuss how these skills can be transferred across different, con different contexts as well. Next. Let's take a look first at power and some ways that it's displayed. So at the top you see institutional, social, and individual power. And power is the ability to control and influence circumstances or access to resources and or privilege. Privilege is an unearned advantage given by our society to some people, but not to all, by virtue of their relationship and access to power. So an example of privilege might be the unquestioned ability to apply for a job and have the interviewer assume that you are qualified for that job. Um, another word we need to also think about is oppression. So oppression can be systemic. And today we're focusing specifically on systemic oppression and how allies can be used in that. And oppression is systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout society. That benefits some individuals with more privilege and harms those with fewer privilege. So in this chart, there are those with power and those without. Those people who are without power are more affected, um, more disparately affected by systemic oppression. Then an ally is someone who is a member of a social group that has some institutional, social, and probably individual power, and who uses their privilege to end oppression and to understand their own, um, their own, their own privilege. So allies are people who help those without power by supporting, advocating, and promotion, promoting social justice in order to benefit the society as a whole. It's a myth that those without power, when they achieve some measure of institutional, social, or individual power, will be in competition with those who have. That's a myth. There are enough resources for all. There is no scarcity of, of opportunity. There is no scarcity of resources in this country. Next. Oh, the other thing I want you to, I should have mentioned is the word intersectionality. And what that means is that the reality is that people can be subject to multiple systems of oppression that intersect and act, interact with each other. And that term was coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. So here you have um, some police officers kneeling in support of the demonstrators. And this is significant for a number of reasons. One, referring back to the other slide, the police have institutional power, and yet in this instance, they are symbolically offering themselves as allies in this moment. We don't know what happens beyond this moment, but in this moment, they are presenting themselves as allies. This is also significant because the, this took place in St. Louis, where in 1950, or, I'm sorry, 2015, um, Michael Brown was killed by police and sparked the beginning of the Black Lives Movement. Next. One of your questions might be, well, why would I want to be an ally to marginalized people? So see if any of these are things that you can say yes to. Uh, I have resources, knowledge, and skills that can help others. I want to participate in writing injustices and building healthy communities. 
And thirdly, I care about all people. If you can answer yes to any one of those, um, being an ally might be a direction you want to go. Can you get the next one, please? So time for a little bit of introspection. What are your strengths? What are some of your issues? As you see, the, the uh, meme is woker than thou. So I want to encourage allies not to be or think of themselves as rescuers or superheroes. Allies are not saviors. Allies are not fixers. Allies are not simply looking for photo ops. And it's not simply a hashtag. You might think as you are doing this work of linking together with others uh, about this element of performance. Sometimes people like to be seen. Sometimes they like to post on Instagram or Facebook that they were there in this demonstration. May I encourage you not to do that. May I encourage you not to use the suffering of, and struggles of other people to present yourself to your public. Next. So as an ally, what will you do in this situation? In the ideal world, being confronted at a protest would not be the starting point of your action. In fact, I would say before you're at a protest, hopefully you've asked yourself why you want to be an ally. You want, you've asked yourself, when should you be an ally? And what do you have to offer? Here's some tips. Number one, know your level of commitment. It's a terrifying thing, as you can imagine, this, this young woman, to have some person who's bigger than her staring down into, into her face. Know your own level of commitment, including the level of risk that you can handle. And off the top, develop a self-care plan. And by self-care, I mean what happens when you are at your limit? What happens when you are scared beyond belief? What happens when your family members and friends don't want anything to do with you? Find a way to develop self-care so that you're not taking out your distress in a place where it doesn't belong. Secondly, develop an ongoing support system with others who want to make change. Do not be a lone ranger. I would encourage you to take the conversations that you have with your friends and others, the ideas that you have, and think about ways to turn those into meaningful actions. Periodically, review your commitment and your self-care plan. So that when you're in this kind of situation, you know, you have an idea of what you will do. It, we can never totally anticipate what happens in a protest, but it is um, naive to enter into this kind of situation without thinking about what could happen and how you will take care of yourself or possibly those around you. In addition, know your own places of power and privilege. Learn to listen to multiple histories in their own voices. Examine what's been left out of your own education. And part of the way that you can do this is by building authentic relationships with people who are different from you, people who are in marginalized communities. Make a decision about how you will respond to injustice, not just in the moment, but I encourage you to look at changing the society as a lifelong commitment. Next. So step one, Lisa Simpson says, get uncomfortable. So get used to discomfort. Black people uh, have been dealing with discomfort for a very long time. Being an ally requires you to take on some of that burden. It requires you to not always have people assume that what you're saying or doing is wonderful and you're, you're really smart and you're selfless. Might not happen. Get used to being the other. Next. Thanks, Lisa. 
Um, this is a hard one, but I have to tell you, black people are not required to educate you. And the truth is no marginalized person should be required to educate an ally. So I say this out of love, stop asking your black friends what to do. Stop asking them how you can help. They, we are tired. So figure out some things for yourself. Um, you will make mistakes and we'll talk about that. If you don't, there are lots and lots of books, films, um, groups that are doing anti-racist work. And right now is a great time to make some of those resources available to yourself. And again, I encourage you to join and work in groups because the groups can support each other. Next. My hero, SpongeBob SquarePants, um, encourages us not to be afraid to be embarrassed. Um, people will ask you to do things that are not necessarily comfortable for you. Um, you may have to even decide. In fact, you will have to decide. I'm going to take a step on this. I can be an ally in that area. Maybe um, you can only do one step at a time. So I encourage you not to judge yourself too harshly, but I also encourage you to challenge what you know. Challenge, challenge yourself, challenge what you think. Ask yourself, how did I know this was to be true? Don't be afraid to challenge yourself in your classes, in your family gatherings, challenge people around you. And, and here's a tip, it's often better often better received to offer the facts and not necessarily your opinion. Next. So Alabama action. Let's step back so that others can talk. Here's some tips for you. Um, and when you do that, you provide spaces for voices other than your own and for people like you. You get to share opportunities for growth, let others get a chance. Uh, the the uh, co-founder, one of the co-founders and board members of Reddit, Alexis Ohanian recently resigned from the board and asked that his space was occupied by uh, a woman. So that's an example of stepping back. Uh, I encourage all of us in this work to monitor our own ego, our hurt feelings, and to be vigilant about our knowledge gaps. Take care of yourself. Do not ask the black person or whatever marginalized person it is, as tempting as it is, to validate, educate, or comfort you. Very tempting. Don't do that. Next. So in addition to stepping back, there are ways you can step up to actively engage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, for example, um, if, you, if your class has a, a project, a group project, and you notice that the group tends to ignore or dismiss the black person or the woman or the trans person or the disabled person, how might you be an ally? How might you look for ways to support networks and grow and courage to practice vulnerability, to encourage other people to practice vulnerability, to strengthen the, the community who cares about others. How much you find ways to hold yourself accountable. Next, step up. Be that person, be that person. The one who notices whose voice is left out, who's ignored, who's devalued. Be that person who knows people's names who talks respectfully or knowledgeably with friends or family and neighbors about racial injustices. Don't be afraid. I encourage you to lead by example, avoid shaming others. So and as an example, you're, head of an, you're a leader of an organization that holds an annual event. As the leader, you automatically get to make major decisions about who's involved how the program is going to run. So a question that you might ask yourself is, how might you personally increase the diversity and inclusion? How might you personally increase the personal involvement of people who are different, who've traditionally been left out? 
Next. So there are lots of different forms of allyship. Um, black people can be allies for white people who want to grow and change. We're seeing a lot of that now. Black people can be allies for other black people. That is also of critical importance. And I want to say that there are times um, as an ally when you might feel left out by that particular group. You might feel like your contribution is not valued or recognized. That may be true, but it may also be that the people in those communities need to be with other people in their communities for a kind of support that they can only get from that group. Out some of the other forms of allyship might be with and for LBGTQ plus communities. Some of those kinds of allies might happen between LGBTQ and other, other um, folks who want to be allies with, with other members of the LGBTQ community. So that there might be other allies who are members of ethnic or economic communities who want to learn to be allies with across the board with those people with black people with lgbtq people with um with other ethnic communities so all of these things that i've talked about these skills are applicable to whatever group you are an ally for the key issue is that you are a person who has power and privilege in some way shape or form and you are lending that to other people who need you in order to build a society for all. Next. So to summarize, please do this. Listen, be open, and be without judgment. Practice that. Acknowledge your bias, your privilege, your history. This takes a lot of work, and it is often uncomfortable. And if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. We wouldn't be in the situation that we are now. Be a reference and a resource. Think about your network of people. What can you leverage and who can you connect to whom? Next. And again, please don't do this. Don't expect others to do the work. We have centuries and centuries of evidence that waiting for someone else to do it is not going to change anything. Choosing to be an ally means that you are accepting responsibility. It's on you. Secondly, don't compare struggles. This is not a competition for who has it worse. Ego and solidarity cannot live together. Thirdly, don't get defensive. It's very likely that you will be called out at least once. And if you're not called out at least once, if you're not uncomfortable at least once, you're not doing the work that needs to be done. We don't grow in situations where we are comfortable. We grow because things are asked of us and we rise to the challenge. So stay focused. And finally, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. We need you. Here are some resources. This is the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion on campus. You all know them. They're wonderful people. And I thank them for bringing me here. And then absolutely finally, I have two things to say. Next slide. Oh, actually I have two, two other things to say. Here's the list of resources that should be available to you. This is just about allies. There are multiple, race, uh, multiple anti-racist resources available that are, um, you can get from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Next. So here are my two things. One, there's more than one virus affecting our lives and our communities. So wash your hands and don't be a racist. And then the final thing I would say, roll tide. Thank you very much. How about some questions? Dr. Trujillo, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, what have you found that is most challenging to people who are wanting to, to be actively engaged in being an ally over time? Because I know you've worked with lots of groups. 
What's been most challenging over time? For those who want to be allies who've not been engaged in, quote, the work before. And, the, and, and maybe you'll talk about what the work is for folks. Okay. So let me, let me say that the, the most challenging thing is just being tired and feeling like whatever it is that you're doing is not making a difference. That you, you're attending demonstrations, you're reading, you're studying, you're building yourself up, and nothing changes. So for example, when our dear brother was murdered um, the other week, for some people, it felt like a continuation of centuries and centuries of abuse and violence. So it's very easy to get discouraged because we don't see the change happening. Um, so, so some of the work could mean advocating for economic justice. It could mean making sure that there are opportunities for people who are different from yourself, from ourselves, to have access to the things that we do. That could be education, it could be jobs, it could be health services. So e equality, equity, access, inclusion for the benefit of all. Okay, great. Looks like we've got a question here. Uh, someone said that they thank you for talking about the paradox of um, being asked to speak up and also to be quiet and listen. What's your advice on holding people accountable uh, in the work without shaming? That's so important. One of the things, just if I can digress for a second about shame, is that it silences people, one. Uh, most of us don't change because we're shamed. In fact, we become more alienated from possible sources. Shame, I think that when we see, when we see people in protests who are so, I'm talking about the other protesters, counter protesters, who are so angry, like that man looking over, over the young woman, um, there's some deep hurt and there are some deep wounds there. So shaming people does not erase that. In fact, it, it enhances that. So, so typically, to answer the question, what I would suggest is rather than say, you should know better than that, a question might be, if you have a relationship with that individual, say a family member, say more about how you came to feel this way. I'd like to know more about how you think. And even if inside your guts are squirming because you don't really want to hear how they think, by treating people like human beings and assuming that if we have opportunities, we will do better, we eventually win over other allies. And again, it's not a quick fix. The world is not waiting for you to come out and change them. Here's another question. Um, you spoke about social justice. Do you have suggestions on how we respond to people who are worried that social justice will harm their standing or position? Mm -hmm. How do we help them through uh, equity that is not a zero-sum game? Okay, so you've highlighted, the questioner has highlighted the underlying fear a, we fear change. We all do as human beings. But secondly, it sounds like uh, the, the persons that the individual is talking about have some fear of loss. Get them to talk about their fear, not necessarily to correct them, but in order to change people, we have to know who they are and how they think. We have to be able to present ourselves to them as change agents, as trustworthy. Again, it's a lot of work, it's tiring, it's exhausting, which is why you have to build up your support sources in order to reach out to people who don't necessarily feel that way. Um, knowing the facts, for example, knowing the, and I know knowing the facts has taken a certain amount of um, negative connotations these days, but, but for example, knowing, knowing the facts and figures about unemployment, knowing how much was spent on a particular issue, knowing what defunding the police system actually means, uh, I'm pretty sure that people will start to conflate defunding the police with disbanding the police, not the same thing at all. So it's important to know what it is that you're talking about from multiple sources, 
not necessarily Facebook. In fact, probably not Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. It occurs to me also that, that this questioner really was talking about people who operate with a scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. If you're empowered, then whoa, what's going to happen to me? Right. That that's a real challenge for some people as I think about social justice. Yes, it is. Absolutely. We're kind of geared that way. Um, and, and I want to be careful how I say this, but that that sense of competition for re resources is built into our capitalist system. That's kind of how it is. Now, I'm not anti-capitalism, but I, but I recognize that there are some inherent challenges. Scarcity is, is part of that, fear of scarcity. Just as a, a quick note, though, I would, I would say just as um, we saw on the news lines of people uh, on, on the highways and in cities trying to get into food banks, we also saw farmers having to destroy crops, we saw milk being poured out, we saw all of that. So it's not even that there was a scarcity of resources, there was a problem in getting those resources to those people, there was a, way, a problem in compensating people for, for those resources. So I'm, I'm saying that to say, let's also uh, educate ourselves all right, here, here's another question, and this is what I call the um, oppression Olympics, essentially. So the question is, what is your advice for people who compare struggles? For example, Group X has had it worse than Group Y, and, and right. many times for, for folks that do this work, we call that the oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what are your recommendations? I have, so I'm not sure if the person is asking if the rec if my recommendation for how to stop that or how to respond to it so okay. if, we're, if we're talking about and, and you know i had this example i had this experience once and i'll make it a quick story mm -hmm. i was working on this project that was uh, designed uh, to focus on women and uh, the woman that i was in conversation with was a caucasian woman and she said you know there's talk about race issues and there's talk about gender issues but mm -hmm. I think gender is, is a bigger deal than race is. And, and I retorted to her, um, well, I have been and will be black all my life. And in the words of my uh, beloved Shiro, Sojourner Truth, I must ask you, mm -hmm. ain't I a woman too? Mm -hmm. so we're talking about intersectionality. And that's, I then ask her, under it. what authority do you have the ability to talk about who has it worse? And I don't even think that really legitimizes or empowers the conversation about who's got it worse. We're talking about how do we build for everybody, not who's right. got the worst deal going. Yeah, and I think that's probably natural or human nature or capitalist natural, I don't know what, to wanna to compare your struggle. I, I think fundamentally when we rank oppression, we are really saying, I need somebody to care about what I'm going through. And I'm not feeling any sense of power about that. You think you got it rough, let me tell you about my life. So it's a way of um, negatively feeling powerful in, in, in one sense, but it also re represents a lack of understanding of intersectionality and how power is distributed who distributes power, how oppression works. Some of us have, have advantages in some situations. Example, we hardly hear about Native American struggles with COVID, and it's absolutely devastating on those, on those reservations. Um, that does not diminish the fact that there are disproportionate numbers of black and brown people who are affected by COVID. It says that there's not uh, a way for, or there's not an accepted means to talk about COVID across racial cultural lines. Okay. Uh, here's another question. It seems that confronting our own biases and racial reality can trigger significant discomfort, and people may avoid this topic altogether because of that. Any right. recommendations on how to help people get through the discomfort that, that is often inherent in looking at yes. oppression? Yes, so one of the reasons that I like examples like Lisa Simpson and SpongeBob SquarePants is, is precisely that. Those are, those are folks, those are cultural icons, not folks, 
cultural icons that we can relate to. And the truth is, and laugh about, the truth is you cannot escape discomfort. You cannot. Um, trigger means, triggering says there's something beneath here that needs to, ex needs to be explored. Maybe I need to get some work on, have some work done with myself, with um, professional others or friendly others around particular issues. It's virtually impossible not to get triggered doing justice work. It's virtually impossible not to feel uncomfortable. So here's, a, here's another very interesting question. How do you suggest handling speaking with an individual who is a victim, who is victim shaming marginalized people by saying that they're bad people because they had a criminal record and therefore don't deserve to be glorified? And, 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 and this is a constant pattern that we've mm -hmm. seen in the media that mm -hmm. whenever there has been a, a person that has been unarmed and murdered, mm -hmm. the first thing they do is go back and say, what is their rap record? As, as if the life is less valuable yes. because they had some challenges in their past. So what recommendations do you have for those folks? I, well, the recommendation that I would have is that this is where <laughs> groups of people can be helpful. Where, for example, um, and this is a roundabout answer, but where, for example, citizens can um, talk to the television stations and say, you know, I've seen this, this, and this portrayal and I want to object to it. They have to, television stations, media outlets have to keep records of who calls and what they are complaining about. So I would say begin to document um, those things that are systemic injustices, those things that are uh, individual biases and prejudices. We have less control over except to present information in a way that uh, contradicts the narrative. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons we've been very deliberate in this office of talking about Mr. Floyd and identifying him as an American, comma, who was black. And, and it was very purposeful and it had lots of political connotation. So this idea of thinking about the words and the words that we choose are, are, are really important. Another person in our group has asked that a lot of us in higher education, you know, it's a hierarchical organization and those above us may not really get it. And the question, the essence mm. of the question is, what approaches do you recommend regarding challenging up uh, when there could possibly be real repercussions for employment and professional reputation? Okay. And the quickest answer I would say is, this is where numbers are important. This is not a lone range, changing institutions is not a lone ranger activity. You need groups of people who are committed to a particular action or a particular set of actions, building coalitions with similarly minded people and slowly but surely moving the needle. You just had a, a situation um, at Alabama with your, with some Confederate statues? Removing, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you, can you share that? Um, and, and as a matter of fact, we've got a person who's just asked a question about that, but uh, the board and the president, um, we're in agreement and have decided to remove the plaques of Confederate soldiers that were affiliated with the university from in front of our library. And then there's going to be a larger committee that's going to begin to look at some of the names of the buildings uh, that are attached to people that are known and documented as white supremacists or who were slaveholders. And this is not only happening on our campus, but lots of campuses, at least I know for sure in the SEC. And, and so one of the questions that, um, the person asks is, with the history of complicit relationships and ongoing role of perpetuating systematic racism um, in PWIs, predominantly white institutions, how do we ensure that our efforts as allies do not come across as insincere, inadequate, and get perceived as capitalizing on the situation and mm -hmm. present a false image uh, about the university? And that's a really important, that's come up a lot uh, in conversations I've been having with groups. We're serious at heart. We want to make a difference, but we don't want to seem like we're just um, faking it or as the students have said to me, we're chasing clout, okay. uh, that we sincerely want to do right. And so what would be your advice for people who, who are wanting to make an impact and wanting to make a change, but feel like there's a, a potential that people might see it as just a, a quick fix? Okay, so um, I just want to reiterate that nothing about changing our social world is easy, 
comfortable, welcomed. Um, most of the people that we label as heroes, we don't do it until after they're dead, probably after they've been assassinated. Martin Luther King example. So um, part of it, in order to be an activist, requires cultivating a thicker skin in terms of needing the approval of other people to do what God has laid on your heart to do. And maybe God didn't lay it on your heart. Maybe it's a deep sense of calling that you have to move in a certain direction, to, to offer that, to be committed. So um, yes, we always run the risk of, of looking stupid, jumping on the bandwagon, being naive or being, na or being idealistic. That's always a possibility. Uh, again, I think the support of the group, of a group, of supportive others can help us through these times. One of the, one of the things is that even though activism is, has happened forever, we've never been in a space like this. This is brand new. We've never been in this moment before. So we're learning some things by doing. It requires patience. It requires trial and error. When we're wrong, we say, I'm sorry, and we keep it moving. You know, and let me also add to that, that um, in my work, I've found that there are probably three pieces, uh, and Dr. Trujillo, you and I have talked about this, that transparency is important. It's okay, and that's sometimes hard to do in a, 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 an academic environment. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I don't know it, or I don't know everything, but to be willing to learn. The second is to be um, consistent over time. Transparent, authentic, and to be consistent over time. Yeah. I think part of what, and I think the nation is really asking this question, what, so they're actually, getting ready to, to um, lay Mr. Floyd to rest. Mm -hmm. So once this has happened, when the protest in, then what? Mm -hmm. uh, really working as allies, this signals that you're just beginning the work. Yes. Because as we look around, you will see injustices everywhere. If we just even look at COVID-19 and the disparate impact that it's had on people in this state in the Black Belt, there are lots of opportunities for us to be engaged. I think you've got to find your niche. You got to find your niche, whether it's in, the, and, and being an ally isn't always just about being out in the streets. Nope. Sometimes it's saying, I'm going to give resources to organizations that are focused on making change. We see the opportunities for allyship in lots of different ways, but this issue of being transparent, being authentic, and being consistent over time, I think is one of the greatest gifts that you can give if you're willing to be an ally. So that means you show up. Amen. You show up. All right, let's see if we've got another question. <laughs> oh, and I'm, I'm told that the boulder in front of Gorgas is being removed even as we're speaking. Hmm. So here's a person who uh, has the opportunity to supervise students and they want to have recommendations on what they can do as a white person supervising and supporting black students. Okay. The first thing that I say to white people who want to be supportive and helpful is Make sure that you are talking to other white people, not only talking to black students. Um, get us, do reading, do watch movies, um, have some understanding of what the issues are that your students are experiencing. And then be willing to present yourself as an authentic human being, flawed, um, as we all are who doesn't have the answers, um, but who's willing to step out of their comfort level, be willing to learn. We have a tremendous opportunity right now to remake ourselves as individuals and, and as a, a nation. That's challenging, it's uncomfortable, but it's an awesome opportunity. There are no, there, I don't have a formula for how black people should, or I'm sorry, how white people should make black people feel comfortable. Quick story, I was in a, a dollar store once and um, a woman, a white woman signaled me to come over and she had, um, she had in her basket some orange pop and, uh, and some Flamin' Hots. And she said to me, I'm, I'm gonna have a group of, of young African-American teenagers come over to my house. And what do you think about this? I was horrified. 
And, but I said to her, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's have some nutritional food. And she said, but this is what they like. And I said, but you know better. Would you eat this? Quick story. Right. So, so I'm hearing you say in part that um, there's benefit in getting in groups and doing this work, not as a solo artist, but in groups, uh, really resourcing ourselves with information yes. around things. And, and, and if we see something happening in the moment, um, there's some ideas about how we might want to, to deal with that. There are some occasions that we might need to be the backup person who calls 911. Okay. There might be a time that we might serve as a person who provides a distraction, or sometimes people are involved in things uh, and you might want to come up, for instance, the, the, the picture that you used earlier in your presentation where the guy's towering over this young woman, mm -hmm. being an ally might be coming up to them to say, that looked uncomfortable to me. Can I assist you or provide support? And I'm glad you said that because that's, the, that's very important to ask the person if, if you may be of service not to, if you're a part of a, a, the power group, it's important not to just jump in and assume, again, that you're the savior. Ask that woman, would you like some assistance? Would you like some support? Um, another very common example, um, you're, in the, you're in the bathroom, if you're, let's say you're a woman, I don't know. Um, you're in the bathroom and a trans person comes into the bathroom there's another, and I only know this because women, I don't, I don't, I don't go in men's bathrooms. Um, someone, someone else comes in and, and gives the trans person a hard time about being in the bathroom. Um, while my gut response might be to say something to rescue that person being asked out of the bathroom, that does not empower them, nor does it speak very highly of me. It's actually rather disrespectful. So being, we don't get to be allies just because we say we're allies. We get to be allies because we are invited into situations. Right. So um, we do have a question. We have time for a couple more questions. If you've got them, please send them to the, to the chat box. Uh, do know that this uh, event is going is being recorded and it will be placed uh, on our website as all of our uh, events are, are going to be and all the resources that we've been having here uh, can be placed there. Dr. Taylor, one of the, the things that comes up frequently is, is it ever okay to say no? Mm. And, and I would say yes, yes. This is, we're in this for the long haul. Change is not an overnight, it's, it's, not a, it's not an event, it's a process. It's a process. So it is wise to know your strengths, know your limitations, know your triggers, know your support, be strategic about what you're doing, not simply react. And when you have reached capacity, just say, I can't do it today, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Great. Or maybe so-and-so can help. So here's another question. Injustice and oppression is universal and it is more apparent now as we see protests and activism globally as sparked by the Black Lives Matter movement. What's your advice for someone who's a foreign national that wants to be an ally here in the US, especially when there might be legal repercussions yes. and their voice yes. their political around political concerns? Yes, yes, uh, and that's, that's real. And I would encourage that person to do what they can legally Always, with, as with any ally, assess your own risk, assess your own commitment. I am not calling anyone to martyrdom. We're not, martyrs, martyrs are symbolically effective, but um, as far as accomplishing specific goals, being a martyr does not necessarily guarantee that. So know, know your limitations, know what you can do. There are people, we have stories from the uh, immigration movement of, of people who were undocumented who do very brave, very courageous work despite their undocumented status. That's a calling, that's a decision that they make. Right. I respect them for it, but that is a decision that they make. 
Uh, one of the questions in the box, and I'll give this just as an FYI for the group, they're asking if we're going to continue these conversations and discussions in the fall. The answer is absolutely yes, because we anticipate that our students, and many students already have made um, statements, they want to be involved, they want to be engaged, and we want to assist them mm -hmm. in doing that. So we'll absolutely continue these types of conversations in the fall. Uh, but we'll also be having things throughout uh, July and again, uh, throughout the summer rather. Again, if you go to our website, you'll see all the events that we have planned throughout the rest of June. And we'll be starting, ah, we're gonna read collectively white privilege and we're now organizing how we're gonna have those conversations. Our fabulous library has uh, been able to secure an electronic copy of it. So mm -hmm. I can read for a couple days and then pass it on to the other person. Mm -hmm. I understand it's a very difficult book to get at the moment, but White Privilege is a book that we're going to be doing as a campus read, and we invite you to join us uh, in that process. Dr. Tahilio, I know in your work that you're not only uh, a scholar, but you're also an activist, and that you, in every community that I've known that you've lived in, you've gotten out, and I mean literally, into the streets where there's been conflict, where there have been problems, where there have been challenges. And I've always admired you for your commitment and your willingness to do what I'm sure at times must have been uncomfortable for you. Because it's hard to go to a place where a group has just lost a loved one. Reflecting on that, because I, I perceive that also as being your call in allyship, uh, what, what words would you give us um, as guidance uh, that perhaps you've not already shared about first identifying what we want to be involved in and second how to see that thing through and I've watched you do it from afar for many many years. I, I believe it's Parker, is it Parker Palmer who talks about where your great passion meets the world's need. That that intersection is is if you want to talk of it in terms of calling it might be that place. Um, but I, I, I do want to say, I don't, I, this isn't exactly your question, I want to say this, I want to stress that um, being an ally does not mean you have to do this ginormous, um, public, big thing. I would encourage most people to start with whatever's in front of you, wherever you are, there's, there's some need that you can join with. There, it's there. There's, there's something that anybody can do. And we get better the more we do it. We get stronger the more we do it. Uh, in, in terms of learning together, um, I, I'm so glad that you're, you're going to be doing these groups because people support each other. We have, again, we have an opportunity to make a new society that's built on respect for all human beings. Never been done before. I am so proud of young people and students like at Alabama that you're doing what our what my generation failed to do. So good on you. <laughs> That's delightful. Uh, one one final um, uh, comment. I, I I just like to say to to those who have joined us. But as Dr. Trio has said, there's many opportunities to be involved and to be engaged. And as I often talk about uh, the Wizard of Oz, we have to keep in mind in terms of being an ally that number one, it is a thinking program process. You know, Dorothy first met the scarecrow who needed a brain. This is about information. So we've got to information ourselves. We've got to have information about the issues that we're concerned about. Second. From reputable sources. Yes, from reputable sources. Okay. Thank you. Second is she was she ran into the, the, the tin man who needed a heart. And these issues are about people and potential and opportunity. And we want to make sure that we can do all of that. And probably the most important one as it applies to allyship is when they met uh, the cowardly lion. That this is going to take our ability to be courageous. Mm -hmm. And the courage might just be when you're having coffee with somebody, you hear them say something that's not it's not appropriate because what we saw in the death of um, Mr. Floyd probably started with someone being around someone who accepted perhaps the ideology that we believe that may have been operating at the time of his death. Mm -hmm. And so we need to stop those things where we can, remembering that we need the information, 
that we're talking about empowering lives and that it's going to take courage on our part. Any concluding comments for us, Dr. Trujillo? Hmm. No, I, I think you have said it all. I'm grateful to be here. Um, you will have my contact information, and if any students, faculty, staff, anybody wants to uh, continue this conversation or wants anything that I can offer, I'm here. Right. Well, I can't wait to welcome you back to Sweet Home Alabama. I can't wait to come, come back. back. Come on back soon. Love and again, it. To our participants, every bit of resource around this topic is going to be located on our website. All the resources that Dr. Trujillo has sent and those that we're collecting. If you have some things you'd like to add to our collection, please send them to diversity at ua.edu. And we invite you back on Thursday at one o'clock to have some reflections on the infamous stand in the schoolhouse door. Thank you so very much and yes. roll tide. Good evening.